All right. So we are back and I'm going to do another, uh, well, part two of the testing. I just wanted to show a couple of documents for you guys. Um, just some some good information I want to share with you guys before I, I stop this um, this particular uh, presentation or preview, whatever you want to call it. But I definitely want to show you guys some um, some of the information that I have that I'm going to be incorporating into this uh, upcoming uh, lecture. So let me go ahead and uh, pull a couple things up for you guys. Let's go ahead and see what I got in my bag of tricks. Um, so what's up there right now? Still, this is this has to do with the Lashish Ashraka that you can go ahead and um, uh, look up yourselves if you want. Um, this is the translations of the Lashish Ashraka. All right, um, and uh, this stuff is really good information if you want to um, know what the soldiers, what you know, their level of education. If you want to know, um, you know, the things that influenced them, how they felt during this period of time with the uh, Lashish Ashraka, and this is during. Um, the time when the Assyrians are becoming a threat to Israel, okay? Um, and when you read a lot of this stuff, it's, it's really interesting. Like, let me see, this one here, is Lashish Ashokan 5 says, May yod he wafe cause my Lord to hear tidings of peace and good this very day, this very day. Who is thy servant but a dog that thou hast sent um, thy servant the letters? Now thy servant hath returned the letters to my Lord. May yod he wafe cause thee to see. How can that servant benefit or injure the king? All right. Now, th again, these are soldiers that are writing, um, and you get to see their writings here. It's concrete. You know, you get to see their writings here. Uh, this one says, To my Lord, uh, Yaosh, may Yohe Wafe cause my Lord to see this season in good health. Who is thy servant but a dog that, they that my Lord have sent the letter of the king and the letters of the princes saying, Pray, read them. And behold, the words of the princes are not good, but to weaking our hands and to slacking the hands of the men who are uh, informed about them saying, why do ye thus even in Jerusalem? Behold unto the king and unto his house and ye doing this thing. And as yod he wafe thy God liveth, truly since thy servant read the letters, there have been no peace for thy servant. So he's receiving, this is a servant, um, a prince or uh, um, not really a prince, but like a governor. Uh, who is corresponding with the king or the administrative staff of the king, uh, expressing some concerns. Also, you'll see that they were very, um, I wouldn't say if you say modest or humble, but they degraded themselves before the king. Like the king was highly revered uh, by the people. As you can see here, it says, uh, who is thy servant but a dog that my Lord have sent the letter of the king and the letters of the princes saying, pray, read them. So they feel that they feel like they're no better than a dog you know, in regards to their obedient servitude to the king and how they are obl obliged to uh, obey all the instructions of the king. Again, this gets you into the mindset of the soldiers, of the officers and the laymen that were in this area and their correspondence with the king. And when you read a lot of these ashrakans, and there's a whole bunch of, I think they have about, found about a hundred of these ashrakans. But when you go through them and, uh, and you read them, it gives you a much more vivid picture on how the regular people live. And when you take that and superimpose into a text, it gives you a much clearer picture of what was transpiring at that time. So this is the Lashish Ashrakhan that I'm going to um, put in that PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to bring some more documents for you guys. I know you can see my face clearer whenever this screen is up. You know what I'm saying? If you might see my face much clearer, but it's all good. All right, let me pull up another document for you guys. Um, man, I got... When I say I got hundreds of documents, all of it substantiating the existence of the ancient Israelites, I mean, through each one of those time periods that I showed you from the PowerPoint, I mean, it's 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 incredible how much data is out there. And I've taken a lot of time to kind of like, you know, conglomerate all of this data so that way I can cohesively streamline it and present it in a PowerPoint. Even when I do the PowerPoint, I can't put all the documentation, it's just so much. Um, but I'm gonna put just enough to do almost a two hour lecture on a whole bunch of data, you know what I'm saying, that most people in our community has never seen before. You know, academia may have seen it, but most people in our community has never seen this stuff before, all right? Um, let me go ahead and pull something else out. And, and what this does is that it makes the literature of the people, of the culture of the people more concrete. It makes it more real. You know, when you see the evidence that supports a lot of things that are being said in the text and how some of the sometimes the evidence may contradict or come into conflict with the text. 
You understand what I'm saying? So that way you can understand the political mindset behind the priestly class who are ascribing this text or redacting the text. All right. Now, most of it was, um, uh, you know, because the, the Torah itself, uh, we know it was, was ascribed by Moshe or Musa or Moses. Uh, but that over time has been redacted itself. You know what I'm saying? But during the the recordation that we have of first and second kings, most of that was transpiring during the establishment of Israel as a nation state. And this was when it was in the hands of the priestly class, all right, which is very, very important. So what I'm showing you now is going to be from INH2. A lot of this information I'm showing you for INH2. I may pull something up a little early. I don't know what I'm going to pick out. I'm going to be very random with this. Um, let me let me look into this right here. I have a document right here. Uh, okay, this is um, Elat and Ezion Geber, two twin cities, okay? And uh, these are two cities that were built by Solomon, and they were built by Solomon uh, as fortress cities, all right? And uh, if you look here on the map, it shows you one, Ezion Geber, right? You see uh, Mount Seir right here. So it's south of Mount Seir, and this is the land of Eden over here, the land of Israel is up here, and the land of Egypt, and the Sinai Peninsula is over here. Um, so, uh, th these are some of the military fortresses, but let me, um, this is from, this is my other documents from another side. That's not really what I wanted to show. Uh, yeah, here we go. This right here, let me go ahead and, uh, give you guys the read mode. All right. This right here is the Irani fortress near Kesima. And the Israelite fortresses in Negev. This is by Zaid Michel from the Institute of Archaeology of Tel Aviv University. All right. This is the. Um, this goes on to say the first part of this article is the final report on excavations on the Iron Age site on a hill near Kesima, dominating the uh, the Darb Gaza road to Eliot and Sinai. I showed you Eliot in the other uh, map that was up there. The second part returns to an old archaeological controversy: who built the sites known as Israelite fortresses, when and why. The article argues that the model of self-initiated nomad sedentarization recently proposed by Fickelstein, Herzog, and Etam has been has many weak points and does not answer the question. So, what is this saying here? Again, this is the Minority Report. Here is somebody from the Institute of Archaeology, Tel Aviv University, Zeev Michelle. You can look him up. PhD in his field. He has a different perspective than these three people here, Fickelstein, Herzog, and Ecom. Now, most secular individuals will refer to the works of Fickelstein because Israel Fickelstein is a Jewish secular archaeologist. Tel Aviv University gets the most funding, and he is like the standard de facto when it comes to the final word in archaeology. The problem being is that there are several peers who are equally as adept at archaeology, have done primary research, and have PhDs that contest with his work. But because it's the minority report, it gets swept under the rug. What they're doing is they're helping you to identify these various sites and how we can determine that these are Israelite fortresses by way of the cultural um, uh, emergence of the different things or items that were found there at these various sites. All right. So I'm definitely going to pull out the Irani fortress and the Israelite fortresses. Um, of the Negev Highlands, and um, one of them I showed you was the Kuntiliet, um, uh Arjud or Ajrud, um, and site, and this goes on to the site's location discovery. I mean, this goes in on, on everything, man. There's just so much documentation that I have here, the building and its excavations. So that's one of the documents that I'm going to um, streamline and put in this lecture. Uh, let's see if we can pull up another one. Um, let me see if I can pull up another one. Let me see what we got here. Uh, got the Lashish Ashokan, but I'm going to wait on that. Let me see. I'm about to get you some pottery. Let's see. Okay. Here's an article called The, My the Mycenaean and aging style pottery in Canaan during the 14th and 12th centuries uh, BC. Um, the importance of this particular, these are the footnotes. The importance of this document is that, uh, this is by Anne, Anne E. Killebrew. 
um, is that they're showing you the importation of pottery from um, Mycenae and from um, Mycenae and from uh, the Aegean Sea area where we get Greek and other city states of Greek and how uh, that civilization was importing pottery at a particular time. When we look at the excavation strata, I think it's strata three or strata four, we see a lot of this pottery that's there. And uh, the pottery that's there it goes to show you the importation the Canaanites were taking from these people from the Aegean Sea region. Um, and we see most of that along the coast. What's, what's interesting is that we see a lot of this pottery um, in the area where Israel starts to emerge. Before they emerge, we see this type of pottery, all right? Now, as they emerge as a nation state, we start to see the Israelite pottery that I showed you in the other slide, which is very, very important. So looking at pottery and examining different strat stratigraphical layers, uh, when they do excavation, this is layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, doing these uh, excavations into various layers, you see different pot shards, you see different pottery, and you can, we can be able to ascertain what period of time it occurred and what cultural people was there based on historical accounts, uh, anthropological accounts, etc. So when you study Israelite uh, culture, they were first using the pottery of uh, the Canaanites, all right? But as they merged as a nation state, they started to have their own pottery, which had cottered lids and also had like a burnished kind of bron uh, burgundy kind of coloring with a uh, uh, kind of like a stripe that goes around the middle, which was indicative of Israelite cultural pottery. All right, and, and I'm gonna include this also when I do the pottery analysis, so that, I, that way you guys can understand uh, excavational techniques in regards to archeology span when determining particular cultures in a particular region by looking at different stratas of layer uh, of excavations that they do, all right? So Mycenaean pottery is uh, uh, very, very important. So let me uh, close that out. Let me see what else I'm gonna put out here. Um, this is by Avraham Faust, Decoration versus Simplicity, Pottery, Ethnic Negotiation, Early Israel. Uh, the, uh, the phenomenon, the absence of decoration on pottery in Iron Age Israel. And this is what I showed you before. This is indicative of mostly um, Canaanite pottery. All right. And um, he goes into depth in this article. Then look at all of these forms of pottery that's shown here. The different bowls, the different vases, etc. pictures. An assemblage of iron Israelite pottery from Iron Age 2 at Tel Etan. All right, and you're gonna to start to see some uh, differences in regards to this because a lot of the ones that are colored are mostly from a later period of time. A lot of ones that are not colored from an earlier period of time as these people are settling and emerging as a nation state and they're doing different things to make them distinct from the other people that are in the region. So this is all, you know, a whole bunch of our um, pottery finds that they have there and how they can terminate. Now this right here, what you're seeing, this is Israelite pottery. So you'll see this at most sites that are known to have been inhabited by a cultural people called the ancient Israelites. This is what their pottery looks like in the later stages of the Iron Age. The earliest stages uh, looks like these things here because they're, they're transitioning from what the Canaanite pottery looks like into their cultural identity themselves. Then they emerge on the scene and they start producing this type of pottery here, all right? This is the stripes that I was telling you about. All right, as you can see, this is the burnished kind of red kind of material. Some of the lids are broken, but they mostly have like a collared lid, like a like a polo shirt, like a collared lid kind of um, opening, all right, in the vases. And uh, this article goes in depth in that, man, and I'm gonna definitely include this in an archeological find. This is some late Bronze Age Mycenaean pottery that I told you about that was being imported from the Aegean Sea region, all right? This right here is an evolution of some of the pottery. This is Bronze Age. Uh, Cypria pottery from Tel Dan, all right? And as you can see, sort of seeing some distinctions in regards to cultures and uh, the things that they had, all right? So, um, uh, yeah, and this gives, will show you some of the areas, right, where some of this pottery has been found. Um, so we have here, you see Shechem here, Shiloh, Bethel, uh, Radana, Jerusalem, Hebron. Then on this area, we have Tel Jerish, Tel Kazel, Efek. You have Ashad, Ekron. You have Ashkelon, Gaza, Hazor down here, Lashish. When I showed you the Ashkelon from Lashish, it was found here in this area. Zippor, Beth Shemesh, Tim, Timna, Gezer, okay? Uh, Gezer, uh, I don't see Hazor in here, uh, but Gezer, Hazor, and um, uh, Megiddo, I don't see it here either. Uh, these, these had uh, walled sites, and these were uh, walls that was built by Solomon in the, in the scriptures. And uh, the wall sites at all three of these sites during the stratum of later that they excavated that they know to be Israelite culture look similar, 
You know what I'm saying? Meaning that you had a common builder or somebody had a common blueprint to create similar sites during that period or region of time, all right? So it showed you a philistine sediment, stage one of the monochrome phase, which is right here. The philistine sediment, stage two, the biochrome phase, and then the early Israelite sediment where we start to see their pottery that I showed you earlier. So most of the uh, pottery that we see from, let's say, the late Bronze Age going to the early Iron Age one that we're found of other ethnicities like the Philistines, etc., are found mostly towards the coast. And inwardly, we'll see here coming from Hebron all the way north, almost to Megiddo. Oh, yeah, Megiddo's up here. I'm sorry. Um, we'll see that most of the pottery excavation they found is in this area of the Israelite pottery. So we see a more heavily settled region in this area of this Israelite culture of people, okay, which is very, very important. Right. And again, this article goes in depth, but um, the, the author of this article, uh, Abraham Foss, you can look him up also as a Ph.D. and uh, is definitely uh, somebody that's noteworthy in his field. All right. So, again, that's for uh, pottery that I showed you there. Um, what, what else do I want to show you guys? I don't know if I want to show this yet. Um, I could probably show you this article. Okay, here's an article here. It's called Israel's Ethnogenesis, Settlement, Interaction, Expansion, and Resistance by Avraham Foss, which I, which I have and I'm going to showcase. Um, it was reviewed by William D. Uh, Dever. He's another archaeologist in his field with a PhD who reviewed Avraham Foss's work. And uh, Abraham Foss is showing you the Israel's ethnogenesis, and he's showing you uh, here, you see some of the uh, hieroglyphics here, or what's called the Medunetra uh, script here, where we have some evidence from the Egyptian culture of these people, and I will also show that in my, my lecture. But this book, he goes and talks about the ethnogenesis of Israel, which is very important because that's exactly what I'm going to demonstrate when I showcase this uh, particular um, uh, presentation. Let me see. What else can I show? What else can I show? Um... Um, got the non bose chart. I can show that. Hold on, let me see. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Man, I got so much stuff. I'm trying to pull one out. Um, let me go. Let me go into here. Uh, um. No, I don't want to use that. I want. I think I want to use this one. Nope. Don't want to use that one either. I don't like that one. I want to use. Telerod. I want to show you guys this. All right, Telerod, the home of Judah's other temple. Very, very interesting. Telerod, the home of Judah's other temple. I said, did you know that Solomon's temple in Jerusalem was not the only temple that existed in Judah during the divided monarchy period? In discussion of top biblical sites, Telerod is unlikely to make the list with most people. In fact, some of you may be saying, tell what? I've never heard of it. Where is it? This is probably because it is not frequently mentioned in the Old Testament, and it is not connected with any particularly memorable story. In spite of that, it is a it is a mistake to sell Tetarah short, as it has some of the most interesting archaeological finds in Israel, including another temple. And this is uh, an aerial view of Tel Arad, so you guys can see here. Arad is here on a map. Okay, if you want to look at Israel, and this this article just an intro um, to this. I have. Um, a academic article that goes more in depth in Telerod that gives you uh, all the excavational finds, etc. Um, but this is something a lot of people don't know that there's actually another temple that was created in this area that is not spoken about in the so-called Bible. This is very, very important. This is what archaeology does: is that it gives us more of the story that the text doesn't cover. Now, the Bible itself is not going to cover everything that happened in the history of Israel because, again, there was a political. A purpose for the writing behind most of the establishment of the nation. But when we look at um, other archaeological finds, it gives us more information on the culture of the people and uh, the different other sites and how the people lived, etc. You understand? Like I said, the text itself is a priestly text that is very biased 
for a particular purpose and very subjective for a particular purpose. And I believe it was done because they wanted to keep the focus on uh, the Messiah who was to come out, will redeem Israel from their captivity and their bondage. OK, this is very, very important. Um, because when this text started to become written, they were being sieged and threatened by attacks um, from other nations that were surrounding them. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but when we read and we study Tel Arad, uh, you'll know that it's located in the southeastern area of Israel, known as the Negev. That's the Negev Desert, 22 miles east northwest of Beersheba, 50.5 west, 50.5 miles west of the Dead Sea. All those areas experience little rainfall. Arad is situated in a strategic geographical location by ancient trade routes coming from south and southeast. The Canaanites were the original settlers of this area and established a large city here between 3000 and 2300 BCE. Numbers 21, one to three says that the king of Arad attacked Israel while they were making their way towards Canaan. Very, very interesting. Uh, it says the Israelites achieved an overwhelming victory and named the place Korma, which means utter destruction. Joshua 12, 14 also mentions the defeat of a king of Arad. According to Joshua 19, 1 to 8, this area was given to the tribe of Simeon. A right appears in verse 4 as Horma. Judges 1 16 tell us the Canites, the relatives of Moses' father in law, which was who? The Midianites. Did that in the lecture. All right. Also settled in this area, as did the infamous Amalekites. Very, very important. But let me go ahead and kill this document. Let me grab another document for you guys. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. What are we gonna grab here for you guys? Um, what's this? Don't know what this is. Uh, this is the historic and archaeological view of the Iron Age from 1200 to 550 BCE. In regards to, it says, Iron Age II witnessed the rise of the states of Judah and Israel in the 10th to 9th century. These small principalities exercised a considerable control over their particular regions due in part to the decline of the great powers of Syria and Egypt from about 1200 to 900. Beginning in the 8th century extreme, and certainly in the 7th century, Assyria establishes authority over the eastern Mediterranean area and exercises almost complete control. This is called the Neo-Syrian Empire. Neo means later, right? The northern state of Israel was obliterated in 722-721 by King Sargon and its inhabitants taken into exile. Judah left alone gradually accommodates to Assyrian control, but towards the end of the 7th century, it does revolt as the Assyrian Empire disintegrated. Judah's freedom was short-lived, however, and eventually snuffed out by the Chaldean kings who conquered Jerusalem and took some of the ruling class into exile to Babylon. And these Chaldean kings were working on behalf of the Babylonian Empire. Right. During the period of exile in Babylon, the area, particularly from Jerusalem south, shows a marked decline. Other areas just north of Jerusalem are almost unaffected by the catastrophe that befell Judah. And we can see some of these in these works by Amahai Mazar, uh, Yohanan Aroni, okay, the archaeology of the land of Israel, archaeology of the land of the Bible, and the Bible in recent by Kathleen and Maureen uh, Kenyon. These are all people with PhDs, all right? And it says the University of Pennsylvania Museum possesses a rich collection in Iron Age material for almost all its excavation sites. The Beth Shan strata are particularly helpful in illustrating continuity with the Bronze Age in Iron One. The same probably can be said for um, the Said Diya or Diye, sorry, cemetery. Beth Shamesh, however, shows a discontinuity with the late Bronze Age, uh, given its somewhat intrusive Aegean evidence usually associated with the Philistines. Remember I told you the Aegean civilization is also linked with the um, Mycenaean civilization in regards to their pottery imports that these traders were bringing as pottery into uh, the west, the, the northwest part of uh, the land of Israel where the Philistines were. And we see most of that pottery because the Philistines were buying a lot of this pottery from these individuals, okay? Let's just show you the different stratas and the different excavation sites. And it tells you on the ethnic groups in the Iron Age, uh, this is from a uh, university article. Then it gets more in depth in regards to uh, Ramses the Third is the feet of the sea people, which is important. Philistines are considered to be an offshoot of the sea people when you do your research, because a lot of the Mycenaean and Aegean uh, civilization pottery is mostly found during the Philistine area where they are uh, occupied. And uh, this is evidence that the people that were living there had pottery from this region and they were accepted imports of this pottery mainly because these were their progenitors you know what i'm saying and this is very interesting because the sea peoples was a big problem for the hittites the sea peoples were a big problem for um the ancient egyptians and the sea people were a big problem also for the area of ugarit okay um where we see the amorites of control later on where they just started to worship uh, of el and gave prominence to um other deities 
uh, which caused a big problem. And the sea peoples were pretty much used to exterminate these people and push them further into the Levant region. Okay. Um, and I touched on some of this in my, my, um, my lecture as well, but this is just some evidence on there with some um, PhD references on that. Uh, this is an article, um, I think it's a book called Guarding the Border of Jerusalem, the Iron Age City of Gezer. And this is where we also find the Gezer calendar, which is important. If you don't know what that is, uh, you can do a quick uh, search online for that. I'm also going to include that um, in the lecture as well. Um, this is by Stephen Ortiz and Samuel Wolf, and it tells about the Tel Gezer. It's an ideal site to address current research paradigms located on one of the most important crossroads and mentioned in several historical texts, Giza clearly was an important site in the history of ancient Palestine. Although previous excavations have revealed much of Giza history, there are still many questions left unresolved that are key to reconstructing the history of ancient Palestine. This is about the Iron Age period of Giza. Giza is very, very important because it was a fortified site. This is what it looks like right here for the Israelite culture of people. All right, let me close that. Okay, let me see. Let me see if I could bring one more thing for you guys. Um, and here's something from Hazor. Uh, this is by Dr. Janine R. Ebling. This is the recent archaeological discoveries at Hazor, all right, rising dramatically beyond a bend in the road linking the Sea of Galilee with Israel's northern border. Tel Azor stands as prominently on the landscape today as when the Canaanite city founded on the site was at the height of its prosperity and international influence. Okay, then it gives you a view of the main entrance to the late Bronze Age Palace at Hazor. All right, it says our knowledge of history comes from intense archaeological excavation. Textual sources dated to the Middle and Late Bronze Ages and important passages in the Hebrew Bible. Hazor is the largest city in the southern Levant for much of the second millennium BC and closely associated with the large and powerful Bronze Age cities states in Assyria. Texts unearthed at Myri in Syria tell El Armana, Egypt, and in Hazor itself describe the Canaanites city's role in international trade and diplomacy and suggests Hazor's autonomy from Egypt during the New Kingdom period and most of Canaan was under Egyptian control. The late Bronze Age city was destroyed sometime in the 13th century BCE, perhaps during the Israelite incursions into Canaan described in the Book of Joshua, which described Hazor as the head of all those kingdoms. So we start to get an understanding of this particular uh, ancient Canaanite city, its importance and why the Israelites. See, when you read the book of Judges and the book of Joshua, and you see the Israelites coming into land, taking over these cities. These are not just random cities. These are very important fortified trade route cities, all right, that they had to secure if they was going to establish themselves as a nation state of people in the land. Because whoever owns these fortresses in these ancient sites uh, that were heavily fortified, that was on trade routes, etc., owned the power and influence in the land. And this is why when you read the text, the Israelites are taking these key strategic points because and taking over these areas and, and subjecting the people to their rule or even wiping the people out completely will assure their survival, their existence, their establishment and their emergence as a cultural uh, people in the region. So nothing in that text happens by accident. And these are all major cities that they've conquered so that way they can thrive in the land. All right. So that's that. And do I have another article for you guys? Let me see. How about this? This is called Spectral Imaging of Ashtraka, right? All right, I'm going to read the abstract. By analogy with ancient texts, infrared imaging of Ashtraka has been long employed to help improve readings. We report on extensive spectral imaging of Ashtraka over the visible and near infrared. Spectral imaging requires the complete spectrum for each pixel in an image. The data can be used with an extensive set of software tools that were developed originally for satellite and scientific imaging. In this case, the spectral data helps explain why infrared imaging works to improve text legibility and why not in some cases. A better understanding of the underlying imaging mechanism points the way for inexpensive methods for taking data either in the field or at museums. So what this article is going to demonstrate for you is uh, the latest um, in spectral imaging of Ostraka. Remember, Ostraka were pottery shards uh, or pottery that was broken and the shards were used by the people to write on them. You know what I'm saying? So he's making secondary use of the pottery. All right. And what this um, scientific lab is doing is that they're looking at uh, Israelite pottery and using spectral imaging so that way they can increase the legibility of the text and thereby this helps to assist uh, with archaeologists in reading to see what the text says, all right? And um, when we read it, uh, I'm going to show you one of the images that they have. These are all scientific charts and everything. Here's um, 
uh, documents uh, that they found. And as you can see, this is using uh, the square script, all right, without the Nikud or the diacritic marks underneath, all right? And um, let me see. I think this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is uh, the Koine Greek, also, I believe, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it told you about images of two different wavelengths taken um, of Teb Tunis Papyrus 254 at the Bancroft Library, University of California in Berkeley. Um, let me see if it if it grabs what I want to show you. And this is all of the latest in um, technology on. All right. This is uh, very important. Kerbet Kayafa, which I'm going to touch on, which is a very, very important find. And it's crucial to dating the Israelite presence in the 10th to 9th century BCE. Crucial, crucial, crucial. This site is crucial to understanding the Israelite presence. This site, uh, Ashokan was found there, and this is called the House of Yahweh Ashokan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and this Ashokan helps validate some of the earliest uh, texts that were being used, or the um, abjad, or the, the letters script that was being used by the people in that region, okay? Um, this is very important. I'm going to touch on more of this pottery, and again, this is what this is how the actual pottery looks, and when they actually... Uh, use the spectral imaging and makes it much more clearer, enhancing the pixel density. So that way it can extract uh, more of what the text is saying and archaeologists can better determine that. All right, here's some more of the Ashokan right here. This is the various um, millimeters of distance in regards to determining it. This is all spectral analysis, top of the line work. I mean, when I present information, man, they're using, uh, talking about filters with DSLRs and the different computer systems that they use to determine that. This is all the stuff that's assisting um, here's some more of another Ashokan right here, all Israelite Ashokans right here, all right? Um, assistant archaeologists and linguists and linguists in order to determine what these texts are saying from various Ashokans that I've showed you guys. Uh, I believe these are some Ashokan from uh, Tel Arad, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe some of the Shish Ashokans. I read this article a while back, but um, I'm going to have to refresh on it when I present this information. But I'm going to show you that when I'm, when I'm going to determine what these text says, I got to look legibly to see what this says, see what the peer review it is on this, art, on this particular artifact. But you need the spectral imaging in order to help determine what script it is. Um, once we find out what script it is, the people that lived in the region where it was excavated to better help us to understand what's going on in that time frame. All right. So um, that's just... I mean, it's just so much more stuff that I can be showing you guys, but I don't want to give out too. I don't want to give out too much information because um, I want to save some goodies for the actual uh, lecture itself. Um, I'm waiting to see if I can get some feedback on this. Let's see. Okay. So, um, let me see. Let me see. I I see so many people hit me up and they want to see more information. Okay. Let me bring something else out for you guys since you guys want more information. Uh let me see. Let me see. Um Ah, here's a book right here that I have that you guys may want to read when you guys get a chance. Um, I got the, I got, I purchased the PDF, uh, but you can actually buy this book. This, this, is, this book is like four or $500 when you go to Amazon. Matter of fact, let me show you guys so you don't think I'm lying to you guys. So when I say I get documents, articles and everything, I mean, I get it from people. I get it from scouring the farthermost corners of the internet and going to different databases and archives. And I'd be pulling, I'll be pulling articles from everywhere, man. So when I teach, it's not a game. Everything that I say, I can back with academic articles. But I want to show you guys this particular book right here. This is the Elephantine Papyrus in English. And I'm going to show you guys how much this retails for. I could find it. 
Um, oh no, they actually have some new ones here that you guys can actually purchase for cheap. When I first seen this, uh, it was like a couple hundred dollars for this uh, this book. But now I see that they have this, the paperbacks now that are in stock, only nine left in stock. But the paperbacks that are in stock um, is actually cheap. I would encourage you guys to go ahead and grab this book. I'm going to show you it on Amazon so you can see it. Um, I encourage you guys to go and get this book, The Elephant Scene, Pat Ryan, English, Three Millennium of Cross-Cultural Con Continuity and Change, Second Revised Edition, Studies in Near Eastern Archaeology and Civilization. Pat Ryan, the, the uh, Elephant Scene, Pat Ryan is important in identifying the Israelites that lived on that island uh, that were in that diaspora and what, and what the laymen that there what they what they how they what they believed how they lived their everyday life and all of this stuff helps us to get a bigger picture on um on the the people of israel as opposed to just the priestly class and the kings all right um let me see i have let me see if i can zoom if i can zoom yeah this is really hurting my neck a little bit because i can't really see all right so um i'm gonna be using some of this article and the reason why i'm going to show some of this article because it goes into, I mean, Egypt gives you more, I mean, especially more cultural analysis of the layman in Egypt and the soldier class of Egypt as well. We get the Aramaic texts here, all right? These are all Aramaic texts that were written by Israelites and other people from the Levant region. Tells you things such as boat repairs, a letter for sharing, borrow, and selling. And um, we, we have a lot of ostracon that was discovered in Israel by the Israelite culture by layman people, you know, in regards to trade with one another, in regards to particular issues that they had. I mean, when you look at this stuff, it just makes things more real, you know what I'm saying, than what the text can demonstrate and get you to get a better understanding. One of the most important uh, documents is this Passover letter from 419 to 18 BCE, and that's on page 125. I'm probably pulling it up for you. But the Passover letter is very important. So you can see at this period of time in Egypt, what the Israelites what they were, how they were celebrating uh, the Passover in their diaspora, all right? Let me see if I can pull that up for you guys because I gotta, I gotta scroll down. I can't do it on the second screen because I gotta turn my neck a lot, but let me uh, see if I can, if I can get there for you guys. So I can show you guys what this looks like. It's, it's really, really interesting. Um, let's get, let me get that for you guys. Uh, Passover text. Wait, I just seen it. B13, 3B13. There we go. All right, I'm going to give this to you guys. Because you guys have been good. I'm going to give this to you guys. Let me zoom in. I got I to gotta zoom in. Uh, All right, let me bring this over here so you guys can see this. All right, here we have um, the date, size, lines, place, parties, um, Hananias on the piano of Jedania and the Jewish troop, Passover regulations. This says significant as this letter is, its full intent includes us because of our ignorance as to the identity of who this person is and the loss of the command from Darius to uh, Arzimis. Now, Darius, now we're talking about Persian, okay? Persian area. Uh, it says, um, Hanani, 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 arrived from outside of Egypt, either upon the in in initiative of the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem or the Persian court, or in response to a petition of the Elephantine Jews that were already living there. If the, la if the, if the latter, we may imagine that their observance of the dual festivals of Passover and unleavened bread was being uh, obst obstructed by the Egyptian priests. Okay, um, Hananiah succeeded in gaining the king's confirmation of the traditional rites, and on his own initiatives, stated three of four biblical requirements, such as eating unleavened bread during the seventh day of festival, followed by interlacing of biblical requirements, such as abstaining from work on the first and last days and interpretive innovations concerning purity, fermented drink, and the storage of leaven. These latter may have been recent rulings in Jerusalem. Obscure is the manner in which the first night and day of the festival Passover was to be observed. A home sacrifice, a temple sacrifice. As a festal letter, this 
uh, missive is reminiscent of letters of King Hezekiah about Passover and Esther and Mordecai about Purim. It says, and of the Jerusalem authorities about Hanukkah. It says, the letters heavily smeared and may have been a um, pollen set. Excuse me. All right. So why is this important? Because this is one of a document from 419 BCE, which dates back to the earliest, I mean, before the earliest codexes that we have of the um, Hebrew Israelite literature called the Tanakh. Um, and what this, what this does is that it helps to coincide with the earliest manuscripts that we have in regards to the biblical requirements for Passover, which is very, very important. Day of Atonement, we know about Day of Atonement, Passover, etc. reason why I'm showing you guys is because this is from a particular uh, officer who was going to Elephantine Island. So this is not from the priestly class. This is how other people celebrated the Passover outside of Israel during their diaspora. This is during the Persian captivity period, all right? And it says that the Egyptian priest was trying to obstruct them from worshiping and fulfilling the Passover. And uh, this is, I mean, this is heavy work right here. I mean, um, it goes on to say, though, to the welfare of my brother and may the gods seek after all times. And now this year, year five of Darius the king, which we know is Persian king, from the king, it has been sent to the Arsimis. Now you thus count 14 days of Nisan, and on the 14th at twilight, the Passover observed, and from day 15 until day 21 of Nisan, a festival of unleavened bread observed. Seven days unleavened bread eat. Now be pure and take heed. Work do not do on the day 15 and on day 21 of Nisan. Any fermented drink do not drink, and anything of leaven do not eat, and do not let it be seen in your houses from day 14 of Nisan, sunset until day 21 of Nisan, at sunset. So now, here's the Israelites in a diaspora in Elephantine Island. Uh, instructions are coming from Jerusalem, the home base, on how to sell a Passover in this area. And again, this is crucial as textual evidence of the Bible outside the Bible. Okay. Um, and this is what this actual document shows. And I also will be showing some of that in my lecture. All right. I'm going to incorporate that probably. Uh, incorporate that in regards to language. And again, when, we, when we're looking at the Aramaic square script, which has been written in, this has to do with letters of correspondence using the administrative and political lingua franca, which was Aramaic, all right? This is why you'll see it written in that as opposed to written in the Paleo-Hebrew, which is mostly centered in the Palestine region. You don't see too much of that outside because these were administrators that were going to Israelites that were uh, using the Aramaic because they were in another a nation, which at this time was Egypt, and that was correspondence that was being used. For example, when we look at the modern letters, the modern letters are written in cuneiform script, which is a Semitic script that the cuneiform uh, uh, modern tablets was written at, but they were discovered in the modern Egypt. All right, it's going to show that this was a Near East lingua franca that was being used for political, administrative, and business purposes. All right, now, I think I'm going to end this off because I've been doing this for a good minute now. Um, I'm going to end this off with one more document, okay? I mean, I got, I just got so much work here, man. I'm just trying to figure out what to show. And I don't have it in any specific order. I just have groupings of folders with hundreds of documents. Uh, let me see. Um, let me see if I could bring up something else. Oh, here's something interesting. Oh, that's from this site. I want to get, I have it. Hold on, let me see. Uh, um, this is Migrations, Ethnogenesis, Settlement, Dynamics, Israelites, and Iron Age, Canaan, and uh, Shuwa, Arabs, in the Chad Basin, important, from the Department of Anthropology, University of California, San Diego, La Jolla, California, and Augustine F.C. Saul, Department of Museum of Anthropology, and Center for Afro-American and African Studies, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. All right, this article discusses issues connected with the emergence and maintenance of cultural identities in multi-ethnic contexts. This gives four uh, emergent, uh, four emergent perspectives in regards to the Israelite presence in the Palestine region. And this goes fully in depth. This is a great anthropological article that I'm actually going to pull out and share with you guys. Uh, we have Thomas E. Levy and Augustine F.C. Hull. Now, I want to, I'm trying to find something that, I'm trying to find, oh man, 
let me see if I could find this for you guys. can't find my article but what I want to show you guys is um, oh man let me see if I can find it All right. I'm just going to use it from this website because I can't find my document, but I want you guys to go and, and look up Deir Allah inscription. Deir Allah inscription, inscription found in the Iron Age town of Deir Allah mentioning the biblical prophet Balaam. The biblical prophet Balaam. Deir Allah is situated in western Jordan, about eight kilometers east of the river Jordan and about a kilometer north of the, of, of the Jabbat. The excavators found a very large Bronze Age sanctuary. Bronze Age sanctuary. Remember, Bronze Age, the Israelites were doing what? Coming into the land, and this is the period of Judges, all right? Not even Judges, even before Judges, when they were left out of Egypt, okay? It says, uh, the excavations found a very large Bronze Age sanctuary that had been suffered in the period of widespread destruction in the 13th and 12th centuries. Unlike other settlements which were abandoned, there, the air Allah remained a, a remain in use well into the 5th century BCE. This is remarkable. Even more remarkable, however, was the discovery of a painted text that contained a prophecy by Balaam, a non-Israelite prophet who was mentioned in the biblical book of Numbers 22-24 as a servant working for the Moabite king. Why is this interesting? Because when you see a map of ancient, of ancient Israel, you see where uh, Moab is located, and Moab was working with Balaam. This was in the Bible. Now we got an archaeological find at an excavation site of Balaam. It says, as a servant working for the Moabite king, uh, uh, Moabite king Balak, the site of Deir Allah is technically on the Ammonite side of the river Jabbat. The text refers to divine visions and signs of future destruction in a language that is close to that of the Bible. For example, we read about the Shaddai gods, an expression that is close to the biblical El Shaddai, God Almighty. Interesting because the individuals in that region will only know about El Shaddai. Remember, we read that in Exodus where the Most High tells Moshe that your forefathers only knew me as El Shaddai, which means that uh, yod heh wav -Heh, which was the deity that the Israelites were bringing into the land, was not well known by these individuals that was already inhabiting there. They knew him as El, and the Israelites was attaching yod heh wav -Heh to El. All right, look. It says, um, on the other hand, the setting is, is not monotheistic. We read, for instance, about gathering of a group of gods. The word Elohim, which is in the Bible, Although plural refers to one God, refers to more than one God in the De'er Allah text. Now, the reason why that's important is because when I teach you guys, for lack of better words, indigenous words, I say henotheism and monotheism. The Israelites were henotheists coming into the land, and when they established themselves as a nation state, became monotheists. And that got later secured when they went in their various captivities. Why this is important? Because when you see the word Elohim, which is masculine plural, in the text, it is not proper grammar in Hebrew or any Semitic language because it always referred to a council of deities with one that was supreme over the other councils. Very, very important. It wasn't until the priestly redactions of the Torah and the priestly writings um, as well, the prophetic writings from other prophets, do we start to see this, this central from henotheism all the way into so-called monotheism. Again, these are Euro-Gentile terms uh, for lack of better indigenous terms. But I'm showcasing and explaining this to you guys because once I show you all these archaeology, you're going to actually see the mindset of the Israelites and how it evolved. This is why anthropology and human migrations and settlements, patterns and archaeology, excavations and pottery is very, very important because it gives you a broader scale and understanding the text that we read. This is why I introduced everybody to the Ugaritic text and my prior uh, lecture because it gives you more information on what was going on during the times of antiquity and that's, that's talked about in the Bible. But go back and research this. That's the, the actual document right there that uh, they found an uh, actual temple there to, uh, to um, Baal 
from this individual Balaam. So now when it when the scriptures actually spoke about this prior to that, this excavation, people thought that this character was fake. He didn't exist. But now we have actual uh, excavation, which discovered this relief right here of a prophetic vision of Balaam. What's important when you go into the book of Numbers, Balaam gives a prophetic vision. And who speaks to him? El speaks to him because he was supposed to curse the Israelites. We want a blessing them. This is comparative studies, guys, when you see this information. But go ahead and do some research on that. I had an article on that. I, I couldn't find it. I have so many documents. So I said, you know what? Let me just, um, I had, well, I had one document that had it listed in there that I placed it. I just did a quick re, uh, um, uh, internet search so you guys can see this. And this is just a little bit of all these documents that I, I just have so many. I don't want to reveal too many juicy ones. I just wanted to give you guys some insight. But so many articles that I have that, I mean, will show you so much information. It's incredible, all right? But I'm going to end off now. Um, hopefully, you guys are seeing everything very clearly. Hopefully, everything's coming in very clearly for you guys. Hopefully, you guys can hear me very clearly with my mic right here and my uh, my uh, cam, my webcam up there that I, I purchased, and I spent good money for both of these items, so that way I can give you guys good quality. But this is just giving you guys some insight on what it is that I'm going to present in this lecture, all right? So hope you guys enjoyed um this test run um, i'm gonna go ahead and end off the session here uh you guys stay tuned to my channel kingdom harmony ministries for more in-depth information um and scholarly academic work um I, I do apologetics and defending the worldview of the ancient israelites and the hebrew Israelite culture here in america today as well as hermeneutics so that way we can better decipher and uh get a, a better exegete of the text itself to know what the author is intended for his audience uh, I like to give concrete data to support the claims that I made in the scriptures so that way things can be more realistic. And I have some information that's going to show you guys that we know that the ancient Israelites have Afrocoid features and we know that they were heavily melanated people, which is very important because now we know who wrote it. And then talk about future migrations from Israel into Africa and from Africa into West Africa into the uh, transatlantic slave trade, which is very important. Um, so we can see a good portion of the individuals taken into the transatlantic slave trade were Hebrew Israelites. Uh, and I don't teach that all the individuals taken in the trend of the slave trade were Hebrew Israelites because they were not from my research. But a good portion of them were Hebrew Israelites and they also uh, mixed with other people that were in the trade as well. And mixing has been done with Israel for a long time. They had so many issues mixing and separating, mixing and separating, mixing and separating. And um, in this day and age, uh, in order to safeguard the culture, there has to be some kind of separation uh, on certain terms, but also some degree of integration with other cultural uh, uh, blacks or African-Americans that must be done so we can work together so that way we can enhance our political, social, and economic status here in America. But um, I'll be teaching on a lot of these things uh, when I start doing my lessons and my future sessions now that I got this uh, set up here for you guys so you can see the projector as well as hear me speak. I've got the mic right here so that way we can do some more uh, lessons for you guys. I'm going to leave this video up for um maybe for a couple of hours before i take it down before i take it down and the other one that i have down uh you guys can definitely just get into the mindset of some of the information that i show um but uh, i see i have a, somebody in the chat asked me if i have live shows every week um i will be starting a live show uh live stream every week on various topics or subject matter i may do i may do it based on my lesson plans or it may be a question that i get from somebody that i go back in and i show you guys but uh, whatever I teach you guys from the text itself, which I can do and I do frequently, I'm mostly rooted in the archaeological, anthropological, uh, textual analysis, uh, uh, deductive textual analysis on the various manuscript evidence. I'll be showing you various facsimiles of various documents, um, uh, Hebraic texts, showing you how textual criticism works, but comparing various texts. Um, and I'm just going to give you guys a wealth of concrete data because I wanted to empower you guys in your studies of the ancient Israelites, okay? Um, and this way, this gives a better foothold academically against other worldviews that try to scrutinize and say there's no evidence for the existence of our culture. And we want to definitely uh, put that notion to bed so that way we can heavily establish our cultural identity here in America and show how it's validated from the archaeological and anthropological evidence, all right? So thank you guys for watching this, this live stream. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, end it here. Again, I mean, I'm like half tired. I flew in, uh, flew back in uh, last night. Uh, well, actually not last night, early this morning. I got in like 12 in the morning from Kansas City. 
Um, took me a while to get home. I didn't go to bed to almost four something in the morning. Then I had to get up early, run some errands, start my contracting job. And then after that, I had to do a couple of things. So to give me guys, if I'm not that coherent, uh, because I'm a little bit tired right now, but uh, I just wanted to give you guys a glimpse of some of the documents, some of the articles, um, some of the concrete information that I utilize in my teachings that I'm gonna put in this, uh, this um, upcoming lecture. And I'm telling you, this lecture is powerful. I mean, I have so much evidence that's going to give you validation for the existence of ancient Israelites. I wanna show you these are dark melanated people. I'm gonna show you the associations within Africa, which is very, very important. And I'm just gonna give you so much stuff that's gonna validate the things that the text is saying itself. So I wanna thank you guys for tuning in. So with that, I wanna say shalom, peace, and black power family. Um, tune in for our next session. Um, I'll post this session up on my uh, Facebook page. Uh, so that way you guys can um, stay tuned. Um, I know I have uh, some other people that's uh, sending me requests. I'm, a, I'm, I'm about 5,000 now, so I got to mm -hmm. constantly go through my friends list and delete people so I can add more people so that everybody can stay abreast of my upcoming um, sessions that I do. But if not, subscribe to the channel. And if mm -hmm. you subscribe to the channel, you can definitely be uh, one of the first people to uh, jump on and, and watch these sessions. So uh, again, I thank you guys mm -hmm. for watching this uh, test run. I want to say shalom, peace, and black power family.